Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first bull session of 2021. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing. I'm joined here by my dear colleague, Ken Kavula from the mid-Michigan area, snowy mid-Michigan. How are you doing, Ken? I'm doing just fine. We actually have quite a bit of snow on the ground right now. Got a a fresh covering last night, and it's it's really kind of pretty to look at. So I'm I'm pleased. Not too cold, uh, upper 20s, lower 30s. But I know that that would freeze a lot of you that are on the broadcast right out of the uh, out of your your warm woolies. But uh, for us up here, that's a that's a warm spell right now in January. Well, yesterday I was enjoying 76 degrees down near where Kim lives, and 36 is a whole lot different. <laughs> well, welcome, Kim. Thanks for joining us again this afternoon. Well, glad to be here, and today it's 76 again. Yep. Good stuff down there. All right, so this is our first session of 2021. Again, that's a reminder to use 2021 instead of 2020 and all the documents you signed. And uh, Ken, I think it's fair to say that this was one of our many themes that we that you kind of warmed up to the most last year. Friends, don't let friends become average investors, or at least we do everything on our human powers to try to help that along. Is that a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement, Mark, and I think it's the the uh, motivating statement for a lot of the people that invest for or, or that uh, uh, volunteer for better investing or for activities like this one, that that we we like to see people from normal circumstances become successful investors and and uh, we we find that there's uh, uh, it's it's not that difficult to do if you have a little bit of discipline a little bit of patience and are willing to put in a, a little bit of of work and by little bit you know I'm talking about an hour a month hour and a half a month uh, this whole concept of investment clubs and doing it for yourself has been very rewarding for me and my wife and uh, for a lot of my friends as well. Yeah, and I I just have to say, I I received so many, I mean, I published a couple of them with permission, but I received so many uh, acknowledgements this time of year that uh, people are definitely smiling and have been, uh, they're grateful for being helped through some fairly difficult times and I I greatly appreciate that. Uh, In contrast to that, I'll probably spend some time on this topic within the next uh, four to six weeks, working with some people who uh, are fairly new to investing that I had a hard time keeping fully invested last year. And when I say a hard time, I failed with a number of them. And, and uh, you know, back in August and September, and they were worried about the election and all this stuff going on. And they walked away, and, and now I'm getting the phone calls. Why didn't you talk me out of it? <laughs> well, yeah, I politely, well, Mark, I, yeah, I that's, that's kind of it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, and <laughs> you can't feel too guilty about something like that most of the time. So you have to smile and and keep 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 on the the good course and keep reminding these folks that it's never too late to start. Uh, and uh, if you start today, you'll probably be happy three years from now. So. Yeah, there was, there's been a number of posts about investing in market peaks and all that sort of thing. So I guess the the real mystery question, Ken, is are you uh, Ralph Bellamy or Don Amici for the day? And... Oh, I'll be the old guy. I'll be Ralph. You can be Don, okay? <laughs> hey, he was good in Cocoon. I think that was Cocoon that he was in. Amici was in Cocoon, yeah. Uh-huh. And Kim wanted to know which one she was. Well, I think she's the smiling bull on the right. <laughs> well, I think she's remembering that... Uh, uh, Jamie Curtis was in this movie also as a uh, a lady that earned her own living uh, <laughs> uh, on a regular basis. Uh, that's as far as I'll go with it. But well, that was the only basic female character in this particular movie, I think. Yeah, I have a feeling that Kim would be okay on the beaches of uh, some southern <laughs> Gulf Island or something. Well, just just be careful where you tread right now with your commentary, Mark. Okay. I'm being very careful. You're the one usually... <laughs> crashes and burns i know <laughs> <laughs> all right let's go ahead and press on that was a reference to kim's addiction to reading and how she's drugged me through a bunch of stuff to read 
Speaking of things to read, here's our standard disclaimer. No investment recommendation is intended. This is all about education and demonstration. We are here to illustrate and remind and possibly reinforce or even enhance the philosophies and methods of the modern investment club movement, uh, whether it's the interpretation by manifest investing and the implementation thereof, or the traditional um, interpretation and lessons learned, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lessons learned by the modern investment Cl club movement at the National Association of Investors, now also known as Better Investing. Please do your own homework. If we own positions in any of these companies, uh, we will uh, attempt to disclose that, try to remember to disclose that. Uh, every month we have a round table on the final Tuesday of every month at 8.30 Eastern Time. It's a webcast. It's free. You may invite your friends and family. If you would like to have yourself or any of your friends added to the reminder list, please send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you'd like copies of these slides or if you have follow-up questions or things you want to kick around, please send me an email, markr at manifestinvesting.com. For those of you in the audience that have a couple of admin items that I'm working on, they will be taken care of within the next day or so as I am uh, unwinding from a few days off. All right, and in the spirit of that, Ken, I think we'll go ahead and get underway. Um, again, love the vista of the bulls as we start this new year. I think we'll hang on to that. Uh, a reminder that today's day, I, I thank all of you for allowing me the time to travel and get back here. And But this is a special day Thursday. Unless we get inundated with by popular demand, we'll return to Tuesday next week. That is the plan. Um, unless unless some type of divine intervention comes in. We love Tuesdays for just getting together, comparing notes. By that time, I've usually completed most of the weekly update stuff. And sometimes there's, you know, good lessons and things to talk about that just simply jump off of those pages. Um, we have a number of topics that are still in our bullpen. We promise to get to them at some point in time. We're going to spend today just kind of reflecting a little bit on where we've been for the last year, the last 10 years or whatever, and just issuing these reminders about long-term performance. Uh, Kim had shared an article by Jeremy Grantham uh, with me from uh, the organization that bears his first name, GMO, waiting for the last dance. And we want to spend just a couple minutes talking about that. Ken, did you get a chance to take a look at that at all, or were you going to fly well, blind? I had already read that article, Mark, uh, because it got uh, it did not get real good reviews from a lot of the talking heads. Some of them that I really uh, admire, uh, that I listen to, uh, Josh Brown in particular, who I think is a pretty pretty smart guy when it comes to uh, investing and who seems to follow a lot of the same rules that that I I think are important. Uh, Josh Brown made the statement that. Uh, this is classic uh, Grantham, and he says this every year. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it it's kind of a gloom and doom. It's not the most uh, optimistic read, uh, but with that backdrop, that that that's the kind of of advice Grantham is used to giving. Uh, that might lighten the read just a little bit for people. Okay, well, we'll take a look at it and dive in. I suspect I haven't seen Josh. Josh's commentary yet, yeah, but I, I would be stunned if I didn't have if I'm not barking at some of the same trees that Josh is, and we'll we'll be talking about that. We are gonna uh, I don't we'll close it out. We'll certainly put the next leg on our favorite books on investing. Uh, Diane Bunny Scoots in the audience, so we'll get her to talk about Peter Lynch's trilogy. Uh, Ken has a couple books that uh, he wants to throw on the pile. It's getting to be quite an interesting collection. So let's go ahead and get underway. Unless you've got anything else you want to add. Well, I'm going to uh, change that third bullet just a little bit, Mark, and maybe add a slash after the word investing and put down accounting as well. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, in investing, uh, we get lost in some of the accounting vocabulary uh, that exists uh, with analysts, and that sidetracks us to the point where we give up. Uh, so I think it is necessary to know just a little bit about accounting 
and I'm going to suggest a couple of books that I've used, not so much to learn accounting, but to uh, create educational opportunities to teach people uh, accounting vocabulary in different ways, shapes, and forms. Fair enough. And as we have pointed out a number of times in the NASC Investor's Manual from 1984, George Nicholson opens with the balance sheet. And there, it's got some accounting involved in that. So, yes, it's uh, an area that we do want to understand a little bit better. I don't know about you, Ken, but I kind of cling to the holidays every year. And I, I, re I absolutely refuse to let go until the Feast of the Epiphany, which was yesterday. It was yesterday, uh-huh. And uh, as you suggested, there is a real nice festival down in uh, Florida that I didn't make it over to, but uh, probably should have. But again, it's just this notion of, I, I think this is going to become a theme if, if we get involved in another successful investing conference three months from now. Uh, and again, I'm just talking out loud. Ken and I have not discussed this. I think this is a, is a valid uh, nomination for a theme to build some sessions around. And, I absolutely agree, Mark, and, and I've been running around in the back of my head the fact that uh, Better Investing has moved its convention from uh, May to October, and so that might open up uh, a, a day last year. Uh, last May, we uh, took those days that were going to be devoted to convention and turned them into a, a three-day uh, conference, and we might be able to do the same with with the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of that week, uh, yet again in May. Uh, I have to talk to my board of directors about it, but it, it certainly seems like something that's possible to do. And, and with the friends that we have that, that do presentations on a regular basis, I'm pretty sure that we could come up with some pretty decent classes. We might be even able to coax uh, a couple of our listeners in the audience today into making some presentations or helping on some presentations. And we're, we're definitely aligned and thinking along the same line. So it's either great minds, either that, or we're both lost on some deserted highway somewhere. <laughs> Or we've lost our great minds, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, until we steer through Punxsutawney, we haven't we have not checked off the bucket list. <laughs> uh, that's coming up pretty soon, too, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. That is just right around the corner. In fact, we'll be talking about that next week here, as we look at the stretch drive in this year's uh, Groundhog Contest. All right, I know I promised that I was going to put the slide away, but I got to get it out one last time. Uh, Again, Nicholson referred to investment clubs in the modern investment club movement as his grand experiment that people could come together leaning on the aspirations of friends to remove the mystery and fear and confusion of investing. And uh, it's worked over the decades. Um, basically, the av average investor there for the last five years is the, the Dalbar, average investor, the performance chaser. Checking in at approximately 5% over the last five years, while the value line investment average comes in at about 10%. Again, that's the companies in the standard edition. Notice that the Wilshire 5000, as measured by that mutual fund, VTSMX, uh, is checking in at 14%. And then the reason for the slide, I'm, I just continue to be enchanted by the fact that even though it is somewhat large company dominated, the Manifest 40, that's the 40 most widely followed companies at Manifest, it's, we use it as a barometer of how our subscribers are doing generally, even though it's indirect. It's an indirect measure, measurement. And uh, uh, it's just a wonderful thing to see 17, 18% over a five-year period when the stock market's going up between 10 and 14%. That's just a whole lot of fun. Uh, in the pre-session, Kim and Diane were comparing their tax bills. Uh, I think uh, capital gains taxes can be uh, a wonderful thing. The one that really jumps at me, though, is 10 Cup. 10 Cup actually closed out a powerful quarter in uh, 2020, ending the five year period at a 19.5% clip for uh, the last five years. And uh, that's a whole lot of fun. And features uh, a number of smaller companies. I think that's part of what builds that advantage. And then last but not least, uh, we've talked about it a few times. I'm not going to belabor it. The round table over the last five years checks in at a 22.2% .2 rate of return. 
I think that's probably the best demonstration of friends coming together. Uh, believe it or not, and Ken, I'm going to get you to vouch for me here. We do not compare notes ahead of time. We select, we make the selections independently. I would say that's true 90, 99% of the time. There's, there's an occasional time in the last 11 years where there's been a phone call or two, but for the most part, it's just, it's come up with your own idea and bring it, and it's a surprise to everybody else. And Kim, you weren't here last week, so we, we thanked you in your absence for Biotelemetry and uh, Cardtronics. Those companies are both being taken, I believe, private or at least acquired by another company at, at a real handsome uh, return to the roundtable tracking portfolio, so thank you. You're welcome. Cha-ching. All right, so let's go ahead and keep rolling here. And this one is a heavier version of Ken Cavula's favorite chart. One of your favorite charts, I love charts, anyhow. this chart, Mark. I love this chart, right? Yeah, I like it, too. And, go ahead, Ken. And we could, we could probably take this chart and, and turn it into the other two charts that I like, which are the, the three-year uh, intervals and the five-year intervals. But uh, this one's not based on the S&P, the chart that we've normally told you is based on the S&P. This one's based on the, the Dow Jones, which is a, a, an older index. You can see it goes back to 1896. So we have over 100 years experience there. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty decent return over 100 years, isn't it? If you lived that long at 11.9%. Yeah, and I love the chart, too. We're going to look at um, the version of it that I like a little bit better that we commonly feature. And it just gives me a chance to remind, because you'll see me make these references every once in a while. I regard anything pre-1940 as the wild, wild west in the realm of investing. And uh, so anything before 1940 on this chart is from a different era, different regulations, different stuff. So when I, when I look at this chart, I'm basically mentally taking out all the stuff below the line and just calling that a different time, if you follow me. So anything below the line, so we're left with just the stuff above the line. Notice that there is a, if you look at just the stuff underneath the line that I just drew, it's not exactly a big fat bell curve. It's more like a, a slightly chubby pancake uh, with some extremes that we don't see very often, like this minus greater than minus 50 return. And then these four years here, the, the roaring 20s were real. Um, but you take out that chubby pancake and you, you basically are dealing with the modern stock market. Again, the reason that I, I think in that way is that the, the securities reform actually started after the Great Depression and the problems of 1929. And uh, the SEC came into existence in the early 1930s. The Investment Company Act was kind of the, the last piece of the puzzle in 1941, I believe. And uh, anything after that was with a whole different set of rules on disclosure and accessibility for investors. Uh, the types of changes that we see today actually were born back then, and uh, it did change the landscape. So anybody that calls the stock market riverboat gamblers, um, they're basically living back in that roaring 20s period in, in the way that I think of it. Here's a look. Well, I, can I can remember my dad just making comments continuously to me as I grew up that, that I should never put my money in the stock market. Uh, uh, you know, his his big uh, investment was to buy government bonds. And after he passed away, we found government bonds all over the place. Uh, many of them had not been earning interest for a number of years. They had been frozen. They were so old. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the that was the way that he saved money and to buy bonds. But uh, I think the the stock market. I, I woke up to it early enough that. Uh, it's it's been kind to me. I'm impressed, Mark, by the the uh, teens. I guess I would call them in this century, the 2010 to 2019, where nine of the ten years are positive. Uh, that's really quite a a record for a decade, I think. Yeah, the time leading into the Roaring Twenties was actually pretty good, and 
And uh, yeah, I agree. And then, of course, I always like to point out that 1958 is near the leaderboard. <laughs> important moment in my history. Uh, Mark, it's also important in my history. There you go. And, and it even shows up better here, Kim. Ooh, this, goody. This, this actually shows the chart uh, the way that Ken presents it every year. So, Ken, I'll just let you uh, expound. Well, there's your bell curve, folks. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's pretty decent. And there's that that top of the bell curve around 10 to 20 percent, probably closer to 10 percent than it is 20 percent if you were to average all those values there. Uh, this is uh, sh charting the S&P, I think, not, not I think, I know. This is charting the S&P rather than the uh, Dow Jones, so the numbers will be slightly different. Uh, I'm looking for my uh, birth year, and uh, it's not positive, so <laughs> I will, I will, uh, I will shy away from even speaking about that birth year. But uh, you were born in a field of opportunity. That's probably it. That's probably it. So uh, again, though, the, this this bell curve uh, has a definite uh, shift to the right as you look at longer periods of time. This is demonstrating what happens after one year returns. But if you start to look at three year returns or five year returns, uh, the, the whole bell curve tends to shift to the right and the number of negative years dwindles to a, a very small number, uh, sometimes down to as, as few as one or two uh, three-year or five-year uh, time horizons or, or time, time chunks, if you will. Chunk, that's a very common uh, technical term. So. I think I'll, I'll put together a slide which shows that. I'll figure out how many years you have to put in there to drive all of them to the, or at least the vast majority of the bars to positive territory. And that actually ties in with some of what we're going to talk about with Jeremy Grant, Grantham in a few minutes about depending on your time horizon and your risk tolerance, there can be a point in your investing career and, you know, and the amount of assets that you have and what, what you're trying to do where, um, you get inside that when that time frame window and so we want to know how big that time frame window is for uh you know when you might want to perhaps be yeah, more conservative with your investing and if we could get new investors to understand this chart and and the the charts that show uh longer time periods uh we might be able to convince them to stay invested even during periods like last august or september or october when uh, your report is that a lot of the folks you were working with were were trying to get out of the market rather than trying to to establish a position in stocks that were way undervalued at that particular point. So uh, it's it's just it's so important that you understand the power of long term investing, and I think that the market has to to rediscover every. Uh, decade or so, they also have to rediscover the power of of staying in the market, of long-term investing, of not jumping in and jumping out and jumping in and jumping out. Uh, I think maybe each generation of investors has to to discover that and then prove it to themselves uh, before they they get to a point where where they're comfortable with. Uh, uh, buying a little bit more uh, if they have cash during a, a period like we established or like we, we went through in March or April or May of last year. So it's, it's these, these kind of charts are important to, to internalize and to remember uh, as you become a better investor. Yeah, and I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I, I go hunting for that uh, chart which shows you the time frame. And at the same time, you mentioned Josh Brown, one of his colleagues, Michael Batnick, actually came out with something that rhymes very well with my uh, frustration with a few people, uh, you know, trying to jump out of the market in time. You know, and when they did it, one of them promised me, well, I'll, I'll certainly get back in before it gets away from me. And, well, the phone rang last week and he says, well, that was 600 points ago. You know, that that's it's just uh, an interesting thing. Yeah, Dwight was making a nice point on that chart, Mark. Uh, he was kind of looking just quickly for consecutive 
years of decline. And he said he was having a hard time finding him. He hadn't actually uh, put that into a way that he could be sure. But just on a quick glance, he didn't see any. There, Mark found one for you, Dwight, 2001 to 2002. There's two years of, of decline. And there's another one, 2000 to 2001. So that tech bubble uh, kind of lasted when it burst. Uh, it kind of, the, the negative returns kind of lasted for a decent amount of time. Yeah, but look at the five years that preceded it. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and take a look at, at how it bounced out of it then in 2003, uh, four or five, uh, you know, three, four and five are, are all positive years and three is a big positive year. So uh, very interesting chart to, to pour over and to put into a spreadsheet and to play with a little bit. Yeah, and one of the things that I do like to point out that, especially in working with a fairly new person, um, in any one year, anything can happen. You just have to accept that. You can't be surprised by it. If you once you once you learn your way around this uh, turnip truck, uh, anything can happen. And I think it's important to point out, Mark, that this is the S and P five hundred, and this does have a reliance, if you will, on on larger companies with a a little bit of a bias towards financial companies as well. Absolutely. All right, let's keep trekking. What we're going to go do is just spend some time giving some longer term perspective. And uh, in this case, we're looking at the value line arithmetic index. Again, this would be the companies in the value line standard edition. 1,700 companies, they can basically average their prices. You're looking at a 10 year chart month to month. And it, it, this kind of helps to underscore. First of all, the longer term trend is shown in blue. That's the five year or five uh, five year trailing average, 60 month trailing average, if you want to look at it that way. But again, in the context of what was, what did we go through in the last year? Um, that was, that's definitely a cedar roller coaster, right? Is it cedar? What's the cedar name? Cedar Fair. Cedar, cedar Point is the amusement park. Cedar mm -hmm. Fair is the stock. So Cedar Point Amusement Park near Cleveland, Ohio. Ken, you probably spent a little bit of time there. Uh, quite a bit of time. It's in Sandusky, Ohio, on a beautiful piece of land that juts out into the into Lake Erie. Just a, a really nice place, really nice place. So again, certainly not a straight line from point A to point B uh, with some uh, messy moments along the way. But, you know, with the big picture of, of timing, hmm. Some interesting stuff. I did leave the relative strength index. Again, something that we'll talk about more and more all the time as a potential thing to think about. Just, just uh, again, stepping back and looking at this from 35,000 feet, stocks can be overvalued for quite an extended period. That's almost two years in that chunk. But it, at some point, they either plateau or plummet. You see it almost all the time. Here's another one. They can hang up there quite a while. We do like to flag companies in the roundtable tracking portfolio when they hit an RSI of 80. And we kind of put them under a special microscope, not just 70. 70 is what Wall Street does most of the time, but 80. And uh, I think this clearly shows that 2020 wasn't just another year. And it's, uh, it's going to be remembered for a lot of different things. Yeah, we're getting some questions from some of our people. Uh, Dennis has noticed that... Tesla has reached an RSI of 79 plus, and uh, does that mean it's time to sell? Uh, we don't we don't think it's an automatic sell signal, but uh, it certainly should draw your attention to the fact that uh, there might be something happening, and it might be an opportune time to to uh, take some profit from it. Uh, I would hesitate to use RSI though as as your only piece of information on whether to buy or sell. Exactly. You know, it, when I'm thinking about that that type of uh, consideration, I look at the RSI and the 80 would mean I, I probably would I would tie my I would tie, I'd tie my hands behind my back so I couldn't operate my keyboard to accumulate any more. Uh, and as far as selling it, I would take a look. I mean, it's a subject we're going to talk about a lot. That projected return on value. 
for a company like Tesla is something that would give me another piece of solid information. And if that was in the, you know, the lower decile of companies, then I, then I might think about trimming my Tesla position. But um, you, I'm with Ken. I'm just seconding this notion that you don't use RSI all by itself. And we don't do that at the roundtable either. It's just a, it's a flag. You have to, and I'd have to say that besides looking at your RSI, you need to understand your company and you need to understand, does it have growth drivers in it still? What's going on within the company? Because uh, I've, I've peeled a few layers of an onion a couple of times and I wish I hadn't because, you know, uh, the RSI may have been uh, high and the stock price kind of settled in right there and then the RSI dropped down and then it had another run. Always know your company and what its growth uh, catalysts are. Yep, no doubt about it. Here's a look at the NASDAQ 100 QQQ and the dramatically good year that it had from the March lows to the, the highs just a few days ago. We're basically talking about nearly 100% return in less than a year. Um, that's just wild. And again, it just underscores the type of year that we had. Um, I will take a little bit of credit for somewhere back in this time frame, confessing to everybody at Manifest Investing that I had loaded up on QQQ. But I believe I got rid of most of it somewhere around here. And that had to do with this. But I didn't put it in cash. As many would do, I invested in some other stuff. And again, uh, this is just a year. You know, here's another one of those kind of peak moments. And again, the point to make is plateau or plummet is not a surprise. You see it again here. So that's why it's a valid flag to torment you into at least giving some thought. Notice that. Okay. The Go ahead, I'm sorry, Tim. finish up, finish up, Mark. Yeah. I was going to say, notice that, you know, I sold a bunch of QQQ back here in early September. And thanks to that situation, the price is about the same. You know, I, I, I really respect and have enjoyed a lot of the companies in it, but that four month time off was not such a bad thing. And I'm sure that I put it somewhere better because during that time frame, I would have invested in some of our best small companies, which just lit the house on fire since uh, Halloween, so. Mark, we're getting some questions uh, about a couple of the numbers on this page right here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the 200 that follows the blue MA and the 50 that follows the red MA stand for a 200 day moving average and a 50 day moving average, is that correct? That is correct, and you know, here's the cue, that the, the clue that it's, it's a daily chart, it's a one year chart, so those are those are basically moving averages, trailing moving averages. So 200 is the long term and 50 is the short term. And that is something, the only reason we look at it, frankly, is because a lot of the rhinos do. And they get all, they get all kinds of heebie-jeebies anytime this happens. What is that? What is that called, Mark? Is that the death cross or That's something? A death, well, you're looking, Kim, at a death cross and a golden cross, both at, at two ends of that there. Yeah, but they're little ones. I mean, usually they're little, they're little tiny ones, right? Yeah, and, and kind of wrong on the first end of that. But yeah, it's it's a it's a they they refer to it as a cross or a death cross uh, or a golden cross. And when it when the red line crosses the blue line going down. A lot of the institutional investors sell. They don't ask any questions. Um, that doesn't seem to be a particularly good idea on May 1st to me. Uh, in this situation with 2020, how's that for a pun? 2020 hindsight. <laughs> um, this one was a pretty good idea, though. The cross going back this direction. Whoops, we, we screwed that up a month later. Get back in and that would have been okay. Again, the reason we keep it on keep it on the screen and even pay any attention to it at all is it's because there's a whole lot of institutional investors we lovingly refer to as rhinos that watch this type of stuff. Yeah, Mark, the, the number that people are asking about is the 14 that follows the RSI. 
and I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to leave that one to you. I can. What you know, the RSI is simply a mathematical calculation ba based on a certain number of days looking back. It's actually called a look back period, and you can choose any number. Um, but 14 is kind of a medium or a nominal standard where you're looking back 14 days and looking basically calculating a form of price momentum. And the 14 day period, again, is, is fairly typical. You could use 12. Uh, you, you know, the more volatility you get the low, with the lower number, the longer you look back, the more stability in it. But uh, again, the reason that we would look at a 14 or a 12 day re relative strength index is because the institutional investors are looking at that. Mark, could you go back one slide, please? Yeah, uh, the 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 problem came that they people noticed that you had a twelve uh, on this slide and a fourteen on the next one. Uh, that's just kind of chance, or just kind of different choices made at that time, or it's just a convention that we adopted years ago because this one's a very long term chart. Um, it's monthly. And in fact, if you show this chart to most people who do charting and technical analysis, they'll laugh at you. And, you know, we they, they, they don't think of it this way. They don't think of a 10-year period when they're doing their charting. Um, so this 12 up there refers to that monthly down there. So that's a one-year look back then, right? Yep. Okay. So, and on the next chart... On the next chart, the 14 refers to daily, so that's only a two-week look back then. So they're actually charting uh, different quantities. And I don't know, folks, if you have that ability uh, as a free service on these sites that allow you to draw charts. My suspicion is that you don't have that much flexibility. Probably not. I mean, stock charts let you do a fair amount of stuff, but. Uh... If you're looking at FinViz or one of the other charting sites, you probably have access to uh, a lot of this stuff. Market Watch has uh, this as one of the options. So we might spend some time even looking at that in the future too, to show people what they might be looking at. All right, same chart, 2020 hindsight. Um, this happens to be the Value Line Arithmetic Index. The only reason I, I want to show, show this one is, again, this relatively strong buy signal back in March when, as we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, and Ken's going to go hog wild, um, the analysts were just crushing forward-looking estimates for companies back in this time frame. And the stock prices were just, just getting pummeled. And uh, I, I can certainly take credit for being out there trying to back up the truck as fast as humanly possible back in this time frame. Um, I couldn't move fast enough to buy stocks while everything was falling apart and everybody's running for, headed for the hills. That's one reason the, the, the front end of this chart is to brag a little bit. The other one is to point out that the value line arithmetic index is not a weighted, a cap weighted index. It's equally weighted. So all 1700 companies have the same amount of influence. So the the influence from a brand new, relatively new startup, it has the same impact as Apple or Microsoft on the performance of the index. Well, what you want to notice here is what has happened since Halloween. And what that is saying is that the small and mid-sized companies with the growth rates, you know, of greater than 7%, 7 to 10%, excuse me, 7 to 12% for the medium-sized companies, 12% and above for the sales growth forecast. Those are the companies that have been screaming and doing well. And uh, our best small companies, I'm sure we'll give an update as soon as Ken tells me it's safe to do so. Um, <laughs> they are just lighting it up while the others are kind of taking a breather. And uh, that's that's been kind of fun to watch. All right, so again, long-term perspective, but again, diving in a little bit closer to, to look at the details. Here's a chart that I don't think you can get anywhere else on the planet than manifest investing. And uh, Ken, this one, this one is off the chart stunning to me. Um, what we're looking at here is taking the value line companies that are classified as industrials, not asset-based companies like or financials like banks and insurance companies. Those have been set aside 
because we track return on equity for those when we're measuring profitability. When we measure the profitability of a industrial company, we're looking at margins, in this case, percent net margin. With a stock selection guide, you look at section 2A, which is the pre-tax margin. Same thing, only with the taxes involved here. And uh, we had watched this thing fall apart in early 2020. In fact, at one point, the expectations for 2020, and here's where you can go hog wild, Ken, they had dropped all the way down here just a few months ago to where they were approaching 6% for 2020, and all of these were off the chart to the downside also. Um, the analysts have changed their mind, and they did it suddenly. Had you seen this one yet, Ken, yet? I, this one, no, this is uh, a new one to me, Mark. I, I have been answering a couple of questions uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, about this chart, uh, and I'll ask you to see if I've been answering correctly or not. When we look at 2020, is this a collection of data indicating the 2020 fiscal year, uh, or are they looking at just the 2020 calendar year? Yeah, it's, it's basically the 2020 calendar year. I mean, you have some companies that report out in January, but those are 2020 fiscals. Um, so uh, I, I think I'm anticipating your question. This still has estimates in it for probably 90% of the companies. So do you, so uh, basically as soon as the data comes out, it's going to be included in here, but this bar still has uh, a little bit of room to move one way or the other as the final numbers come out. Uh, I know that that in my portfolio, which is only 16 or 17 companies, uh, I only have about half of them that have reported uh, to this date so far. Right. Uh, maybe less than half, maybe. So there's still going to be some up and down in this number then. Is that correct? Yeah, as it closes out and... Uh... You know, again, the fourth quarter estimates are monstrously higher than they thought they were going to be three quarters ago, is what it boils well, down to. And, and I find that stunning that that bar has moved that far that quickly. In other words, the analyst really overshot to the downside. Uh, I hope now that the next two bars or the next three bars even with 2023 missing, I hope that those bars aren't aren't showing us analysts that have overshot to the upside uh, because that happens as well. But I can remember this chart uh, two months ago when the 2021 was below the blue line and the 2022 was just barely touching the blue line. So they've moved up also uh, as, as we've watched the 2020 numbers, the real numbers start to come in. So it's, yeah. It, this is a great chart to review every every three or four or five weeks if we can to to kind of give us a feel about where the analyst community is. Yeah, and it's probably a topic we can show in greater detail because I, again, I, I'm heaping praise in your direction, Ken. You were you were right on when you're talking about how far the pendulum swings with these analyst opinions. You know, back in early 2020 when the world was ending. And uh, they always swing too far to the pessimism side. And frankly, I think we're starting to see the the optimism side starting to really take over. I don't know what, what the future holds. Um, I look at some of the challenges facing, you know, what's going on, get, you know, getting through the, the COVID vaccination process and everything else. But I'm also hearing from a lot of corporate leaders that they're back to putting the brakes on again. Um, and in fact, I've, I've they're not amusingly, it's not even funny, um, talking about a snooze button uh, when it comes to general economics again. And I, I, I hope that doesn't come to pass, but you have the analysts going off the scale to the upside at the same time that corporate America appears to be ready to tap the brakes. So I, I do think we are in for some more. Uh, turbulence that's just a that's just a gut instinct it's it's my personal opinion but uh we'll see how it goes well i hope we uh and i hope this doesn't get uh anything political or not but i i hope we find constructive ways to to uh deal with uh uh pushing the economy forward and 
and creating a, a better economy and by constructive. I, I hope that means that we find ways to get people back to work on things that we really need done instead of just doling the money out to uh, whoever happens to be on a list. Uh, that's a, that, that's as far as I need to go on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that I was in a room full of people who pay a lot of taxes and uh, just in the last couple of weeks and they would echo your concerns, Ken. So we'll leave that one alone for there. So we don't want to get in too much trouble here today. All right, here's again another look at what, you know, going back to over 20 years now, um, it was quite a year. Uh, the green bars are the value line arithmetic average, and you can see that it dove down to a fairly frightening low back in March. It recovered faster than any time in history. Um, the return forecast went from back up the truck to everybody be careful out there in a record amount of time. Um, we're going to be down in that uh, 6% area when the first uh, bullet for 2021 hits the screen here shortly. Excuse me for a second, everybody. Forgot to mute my phone properly. But it, again, this just underscores the rapidity and the, the turbulence that was 2020. Um, I don't like it. Um, much as I foreshadowed those those relative newcomers to long-term investing, they didn't like it either. They couldn't take it. Um, you know, those of us that know enough to put our head down and go out there shopping for great companies at a good price, it bothers us less. I think it still bothers us. But the when the roller coaster gets too crazy to the person that's just trying to get into this stuff, it's it's a real... Uh, psychological challenge is what I've witnessed up close and personal. Anything else you want to add there, Ken? No, oh, I think this chart speaks for itself, Mark. Yeah. All right. So let's again put the returns in context, in this case using our median projected annual return. This is the market average return. Uh, like, like I was saying last week, we are back to 2,500 companies in our coverage universe. Um, so those 2,500 companies have an average return forecast over the last 20 years of about 8%. Notice that, again, in the turbulent year that was 2020, we went from, you know, an average return forecast of 16 to where we are now, which is down closer to 6. In fact, we reached 5 uh, just the other day, 5% for the median return forecast. And... Uh, the stock market as measured by the Wilshire 5000 is spiking off the chart. That can't continue forever, but to long-term investors and investment clubs, you just put your head down, find some great companies, take advantage of selling opportunities, and just keep marching on. Your thoughts, Ken? Well, yeah, and and finding great companies is more difficult, and, and keeping control of the sell list is more difficult, and and watching your par of your entire portfolio is more difficult, uh, but it's not more difficult to the point where it's going to take you 50 hours a month. Uh, you might have to increase the amount of time you spend managing a personal portfolio to an hour and a half or two hours a month, uh, but it still takes a relatively small amount of time to find decent companies that you might want to get involved with. I think the great temptation is to move to companies that aren't uh, of the highest quality. And I think that Nicholson uh, was very clear that, that that could be one of the great ruins uh, of anybody's uh, investing portfolio if during a, a bull market, especially near the end of a bull market, if you moved towards lower quality companies and settled for something less than the best. Uh, doing that can really put a dent in in your future uh, profits, your future appreciation. So I uh, I, I urge you to st stay picky and to listen to the par values that are coming out of the the uh, studies that are being done, both by Manifest Investing and by yourself, uh, if you're using Manifest as a validator of your own judgments. 
uh, I just think that, that it's it's doubly important. They're out there. The good companies are out there. It just might take a little bit more effort on your part. All right, let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about this one just a little bit. We'll expand on this probably in the next week or so. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it other than to say Jeremy Grantham is is a really good investor historically. Um some really good mutual funds over the years. He is uh, renowned for being a bit bearish and frequently bearish at times. And uh, he certainly is uh, feeling that mode these days. Also, he talks about bubbles a lot and uh, tulips and South seas and 1929 and the real estate stuff. Um, he's just basically pointing out that there can be a, uh, quite a vulnerability if you buy it, you know, under the wrong conditions with low return forecasts and that sort of thing, you can get hammered. You do want to understand that. So we do want to take a, you know, perhaps share a little bit about uh, that time horizon concept for a, a more senior investor, that sort of thing for investment clubs, ignore this stuff for young people, ignore this stuff. Uh, don't, don't try to outsmart the market because you, it, it very rarely ever works out well. But for certain circumstances, sometimes it can make sense to pay some sense to this kind of stuff. Kim, did you have any particular highlights when you, you shared this article at Manifest? What was your general impression? Or For me personally, in the history of my investing, I've always felt that I have no, my, my, my crystal ball is foggy on what's going to happen in the future. But one thing I know is that every stock has a 52 week high and a 52 week low. So whether we're in a booming economy or not, you always can find a stock that is low in price. The question is you have to find whether or not it's a quality company. You have to, as, as Ken said, you may have to shift through many more companies than you did before to find a good quality company that doesn't have a, let's say a sky high PE. But there's always gonna be something out there. And it, for me personally, I have found for myself, when I've ultimately found something, it's in an area of the market I had a bias against to ever go into. When I brought, um, LGIH Homes to when I presented it at um, Bank and then I presented it for Manifest. Before then, I had read a book and it had said, watch your biases and you need to explore them because you could be not letting yourself be profitable in certain areas. That was the biggest wake up call to myself. So yes we could be waiting for the last dance yes we could be getting into a bubble anything is possible i have no clue what's going to happen but i have found for myself it's kind of if you look for things that you, you don't ever invest in because i'll be honest i invested in bp after after hugh presented it mm -hmm. because what his points were is it's not going to go away and they're getting into clean energy fuel and uh, I didn't get it at its bottom, but it's above what I paid for it now. So ultimately for me, that worked out. I think each individual investor has to choose as they say, what you can stomach, what you can deal with. Yeah, and uh, again, I think, Kim is reinforcing the fact that we invest in companies and not into markets, not into sectors, at least not very often. So it really does come down to finding those opportunities on a one by one basis. And, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects that we know going back and looking at 80 years of history is that we can have a great deal of confidence that if you buy enough quality um, and enough growth, you're going to be okay no matter what type of a bubble burst comes on the scene. And uh, it's just something to take away. So it'd be interesting to have a, a debate with George Nicholson versus Jeremy Grantham someday, but that's not going to happen, at least not in this dimension. 
Um, I, I, Mark, I, I really also think that that uh, it's easy to to classify these kind of of uh, papers uh, as either sell everything or buy everything, right? And and forget the concept that there's a huge uh, spectrum uh, between being fully invested in in stocks and being not invested at all in stocks. And uh, you know, Grantham might be enough. Uh, he might be respected enough. Uh, he might convince you enough, uh, but I hope he would convince you to maybe raise cash and and maybe look more closely at those stocks that are are near the bottom of your par list, uh, and and maybe lighten up on an asset uh, or two. Uh, but I hope he doesn't convince you that it's time to sell everything and get completely out of of your investments. Uh, I don't think that, that that is a strategy that is going to help help you uh, in the long term. And even if your, your term is only the next two years, uh, I still think that you have to investigate the entire spectrum of that exists between fully invested and not invested at all and decide on, on what's comfortable for you and I would hope that most of you would settle on at least having something in the market, something that's invested. And then if we do uh, end up at the bubble that bursts and crash, uh, you might be in a position to, uh, as Mark continually likes to say, back up the truck. Uh, that's always an interesting time. Uh, I wish that, that the back of the truck uh, would have lasted a little bit longer last March, uh, but uh, we've we've been through it a couple of times now in the last 20 years, and uh, it was kind of fun. And I'm I'm kind of waiting for it to happen uh, again because I think it will happen again. I just don't think that you can pinpoint it as carefully as Mr. Grantham has. We you had mentioned Josh Reform Broker Brown in the green room a few minutes ago. I suspect he I know he's an enemy of too much cash. Or trying to hide in cash, so I suspect that we think very similarly along those lines. Maybe we can share some more thoughts about that in the future. The other thing that that strikes me, I'm going to contradict myself here a little bit, is I, I think one of the reasons that not necessarily Jeremy, but many of the Wall Street rhinos struggle so mightily is they pay too much attention to current PE ratios. Um, and I'm just going to cast that out there as a as a as a bold statement. Wall Street spends way. T I I mean I I've, I've lived with these guys. Um, they spend way too much time focusing on PE valuation, especially current PE valuation, and I think it confuses the hell out of them. Um, and I don't think Jeremy is immune from that. And we'll probably spend some time talking about that. One of the ways that that manifests itself is this chart. Um, he basically doesn't, he, well, his firm, basically doesn't see any place to invest outside of emerging value, and that's a minefield. So it's a good minefield, and I recommend exploring it, but explore it carefully. Um, I, I just don't get it. These are actual return forecasts minus the, the real long-term rate of inflation. Um, so you have to add 2.2% the long-term real inflation rate to any of these numbers that you see. So they're talking about the long-term return forecast on most U.S. large stocks being down 4%, uh, small companies down 5%. I can see why these guys uh, have ulcers. And I'm really glad that we shop for stocks one at a time rather than these big, bold classifications. So we'll, we'll spend a little more time talking about that. The other thing, and now here's the contradiction. Uh, if you are somebody that's in that time horizon or a little more conservative as an investor, I do think that the warnings that are in Jeremy's paper probably have some merit with respect to if you've got companies with high P.E. ratios, you really should understand trailing stop limit orders. The higher the P.E. ratio, the more applicable those might be to you. And you can continue to ride the bubble as it continues to go up. And it's probably something we need to reinforce. But if you are a person that fits that description, again, not for young people, not for 
and we're all young here, uh, young people or investment clubs in most cases. But if you want to be protected against these bubbles imploding, I do think that the trailing stop limit order is something to be thought about. And again, the potential applicability of the bubble protection is directly related to the size of the PE ratio. So just something to think about, something we will talk about a little bit more and perhaps do some, some case studies. Um, I'm going to skip over this one. It's the, basically the longer term look at the S&P 500. We'll probably take a look at uh, the lost decade sometime in the future. And then our advice to re-engage the large cap companies back in 11 and 12. Uh, that's actually worked out pretty well. And answer the question, you know, might we see another plateau in our future, that sort of thing in a future broadcast. There's a couple extra slides in here that we don't want to forget. We leave them in there. And with that, I think we'll close down with our bullish library. Here's the collection to date. Uh, Ken has added a couple books here recently. Notice that one up in Wall Street is still on the list, but uh, let's go ahead and add a few more to the list here. And in fact, Ken, you might see if Diane is still in the room. Diane Bunny Scoot Grace. And the two of you can describe uh, how these books are, in, are seen from the perspective of relative newcomers. Uh, Diane's hand is up, so I'm going to unmute her. Go on, Diane. Hi, everyone. Um, Peter Lynch was way before the Motley Fools and, and was one of the, the few educators uh, or individual investors when I first started uh, learning about investing. Um, one Up on Wall Street, which was actually written second to Beating the Street, was the first real investing book that that I used. And what I find is interesting and that I remember is that he showed a chart of Walmart and said, you know, you didn't need to get into Walmart the first day. Walmart's been around now for, I don't know how many years, but there were many opportunities um, to make money on Walmart even after it became the behemoth that it is. And so he, he stressed knowing um, your companies, knowing their products, knowing their business model, um, because especially for people who don't understand accounting, um, if you can understand whether or not the consumer still likes the product and will continue to buy the product, and the company at least knows how to make money selling that product, uh, you've got a pretty good um, start on finding a quality company. Um, Beating the street spends a little more time on, on the dynamics of the market. And for the beginning investor, the book that he wrote with uh, John Rothschild, Learn to Earn, really is a very comprehensive um, book on investing. It, it also covers things like um, interest rates and not just stocks, but understanding the whole financial arena. Um, and so for the beginning, beginning investor, um, I think learn to earn at least gets you on the path to savings and putting your money away. And then one up on Wall Street gets you going into the right kinds of companies and beating the street teaches you more about some market dynamics. Fantastic. Well, thanks, thanks Diane. I had kind of forgotten some of these. And uh, I, I, you guys may remember, I'm pretty sure he wore that tie in San Jose when he was with us. <laughs> and that learn to earn book down at the bottom. Pretty sure he wore that tie to make his uh, keynote address. All right, thanks, Diane. And Ken, you're going to follow up, and it's a nice segue to uh, our last comment for the day on accounting. Go ahead. Well, I, I really think that there are people out there that uh, uh, are befuddled by some of the language that accountants use. Uh, if you really want to get into the language and, and look at more of a uh, of a – uh, a dictionary or maybe a thesaurus or something like that, then keys to reading an annual report. It's part of the Barron's financial series. Uh, I find it very helpful. And it's the kind of book that I don't ever read straight through, uh, but that I use to uh, come up with definitions and come up with examples and sometimes uh, read entire chapters when I'm trying to make a presentation uh, about something in accounting 
Uh, the one that I would refer you to if you're uh, brand new to investing and, and don't feel you have any accounting background of any kind, you've never taken an accounting class, you don't really understand business model or, or even simple things like how profit, loss, and taxes all fits together, that I would suggest you read the accounting game. Uh, now, it's not meant for an adult. Uh, the cover should tell you that. Uh, it's meant for a middle schooler, maybe a, uh, a ninth or tenth grader, written in real simple English, lots of examples, lots of pictures, very easy to read, about a tenth grade uh, reading level in the whole thing. And it makes accounting really sound uh, very easy and takes you from the most basic idea uh, using a lemonade stand as an example and then moves you through some of the more complex vocabulary all the time referring back to the lemonade stand and making it easy to understand uh, for almost anybody uh, that's uh, you know, that's past uh, 15 or, or 16. Uh, I would uh, recommend it for a young person, although I don't think there'll be many young people that are really interested in reading this. Uh, I've said many times that I think investing is a developmental skill. Uh, and if you're an educator, you know that a developmental skill means that you can't learn it until you're ready to learn it. Uh, and I think investing is a developmental skill that most of us don't begin to develop until the late 20s or, or mid 30s even. Uh, many of us don't develop until we start to see retirement on the horizon. And there's a sizable group that, that don't develop the idea of investing until they actually hit retirement age. Uh, I would hope that we could move that age down to uh, to most 30-somethings and some of the folks in their late 20s. Uh, and I think a great way to start that idea is if they don't have this background in accounting to take a look at this accounting game. It's an easy read. Uh, you can go through it in a couple of different nights. And again, it's, it's enjoyable from the standpoint that you're going to learn something that you don't know much about to start with. So, Ken, I'm thinking this explains why when we're on our road trips and we're riding along on the highways together, you tend to speak to me in fourth and sixth grade level type stuff. Or are you taking that out of this book? And well, <laughs> no. I'm not necessarily taking it out of the book, but sometimes <laughs> I think sometimes I think uh, our better investing community, uh, most of the teachers uh, need to be reprogrammed so that they they try to use simpler language to to communicate to the folks we're trying to teach. So and they, and they sometimes I just, I just model that skill for you, Mark. Okay? You're, saying, you're saying I'm hopeless. Good. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Hey, uh, we do, um, just want to make it we, clear that we do keep these sessions on YouTube. If you search for Manifest Investing, you'll find this page. Um, those screenshots in the middle of the page are the successful investing conference from last November. Uh, so you can access any of those. That's what Ken and I were talking about briefly about a potential conference a few months out just a few minutes ago. Uh, we may be putting something together a few months from now. We'll certainly keep you advised. You can subscribe if you'd like to receive reminders uh, anytime new content is added there. So with that, I think we can go ahead and close down the formal session the better investing Mark, everybody before we close down since diane spoke to us she has her hand up again so sure. diane did you have something else you wanted to add i uh, i just wanted to tell a funny story okay. i actually had the opportunity to play bridge with peter lynch in reno nevada uh and i have a, a convention card with his signature on it nice so that was a personal uh really fun time did you talk about investing? Did you get hot stock tips? Oh, you know, not at all. Or? Not at all. In fact, um, you don't do that. Like when you play bridge against Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, you just treat them like bridge players. And oh, okay. You, okay. you don't talk about anything else. You just give them their anonymity. Fantastic. I'll, I'll tell you, Diane, 
Diana, I wish I would have been in uh, volunteering during the time when there were bridge players in Better Investing. Uh, I mentioned the word bridge at any gathering of Better Investing volunteers today, and I'm just met with blank stares. So well, I, uh, I think I was Paul Steinberg online a lot on the uh, bridge platform. Well, I think I was born 15 years or 10 years too late to grab the bridge thing since my parents didn't play. So uh, anyway, I, I so applaud you. During the yeah. pandemic uh, online, and so it's kept my sanity. That oh, and great. investing. Yep. Well, John Kimmel does a lot of bridge. Maybe we need a bridge tournament with Ken and John and and uh, Diane. And Saul. Well, well and Saul. except that you you really need a, sometimes a, a little bit of knowledge of your partner if you're going to be successful at the game, Mark. So. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, once again, I'm hoping. <laughs> All I can do is hope for a happy new year. And with that, I think we can go ahead and shut down and stick around for a few questions, Ken, if, if you're okay with that. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody.